Hello and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's wonderful to have you with us. This week we are looking at a famous encounter that Jesus had at night time with a Jewish religious leader in which said leader just didn't quite get what Jesus was trying to say about the nature of the Holy Spirit. But before we dive into exploring that encounter, however, if you haven't done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet that accompanies this study, the link for which you'll find just below the video in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, another couple of passages that you might wish to look up, the questions that we'll be thinking about later on, and plenty of space to record your own thoughts and observations. So without further ado then, let's dive into today's passage, which comes from John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. The action in this passage takes place in Jerusalem during the time of the Passover festival, and it's Jesus' first document, documented visit to the city of Jerusalem. And it comes after we're told he had overturned the tables and disrupted all the activities in the temple courtyard in chapter 2 verses 13 to 22. If you want to explore that particular passage, we looked at it during Lent. Now Jesus had been noted in the verses that immediately follow that as refusing to trust himself to any of the people there who were drawn to him because of the signs and wonders he was performing. He knew their hearts were told. And this is a pattern that seems to be echoed in chapter 3 and Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. Nicodemus, we know, was a Pharisee and a Jewish leader based in that city and presumably drawn to Jesus by his actions, his provocative prophetic actions in the temple. And there's a sense in which John, the gospel writer, appears here, because as I'll say a bit about later, there comes a point where it appears that we shift from Jesus's conversation with Nicodemus to theological reflection by the gospel writer themselves. This gospel was the final one to be written around 90 to 95 of the Common Era and reflects a period where Christianity and Judaism were going their separate ways and Christians were being cast out of synagogues. And that probably reflects some of the approach Jesus appears to have to Nicodemus. In this fascinating passage, which is a mixture of dialogue and authorial commentary. It's useful to keep in mind a particular Old Testament passage, a fairly obscure one from Numbers chapter 21, verses 5 to 8. In that passage, we're told that Israel had been grumbling about God and about Moses, and they were punished with deadly snakes being sent into their camp. Moses at God's behest, built a bronze serpent and put it up on a pole. Anybody who looked upon this serpent would live. And this story forms the background to what we'll see in verse 14. We have also in a recent study explored verses 14 to 21 of chapter 3 of John's Gospel. So today's study will focus more heavily on its first 13 verses. So we're told in verse 2 that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Now this term has a double meaning. In the first instance it tells us I think that Nicodemus was afraid to be seen in daylight in public with Jesus, presumably because after his actions in the temple he was already very controversial. But it also signifies him being in the dark, in a kind of darkness, in spiritual, in figurative terms. We know that darkness symbolises God's absence in John's particular framework. So we see it in the prologue in chapter 1 where it talks about the light shining in the darkness and the darkness not overcoming it. We see it later on here if we read um, verses 19 to 21 of chapter 3. We see it in chapter 8 verse 12 when Jesus declares himself the light of the world. And most tellingly perhaps in chapter 13 verse 30 when Judas goes out to betray Jesus, we're told when he did that, 
it was night. So he gives us some idea of what's going on with Nicodemus. And he speaks of knowing Jesus to be a teacher from God because of the signs he's performed. And he might have heard about what happened at the wedding of Cana in verses 1 to 12 of chapter 2, where Jesus turns a vast amount of water into a vast amount of top quality wine. But his confession falls short of those of John the Baptist and some of the earliest disciples of Jesus that we see in chapter 1 verses 29 to 49. And it's arguable that even in what he says, he really doesn't actually quite get who Jesus is. Now, if this preamble was an attempt at flattery or to start the conversation off firmly on Nicodemus's own terms, Jesus doesn't buy it, doesn't get sucked in. And he moves the conversation on in verse three using his characteristic teaching formula, truly I tell you. And he talks about the importance of being born from above or born again, if we want to be able to see the kingdom of God. Now the Greek word used here, I think pronounced something like another, means from above, but it could also mean anew or again. These meanings are helpful to hold together, but I think Tom Wright is correct to say that the emphasis needs to be most fully on this idea of being born from above, because it reminds us that the initiative is taken by God, not by us. And this phrase, kingdom of God, is one that we're so familiar with um, from the Synoptic Gospels, where it's kind of everywhere. But it's only used twice in the whole of John's Gospel, in verses 3 and 5 here. And there's a connection that's made between eternal life and the kingdom of God. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. Nicodemus really doesn't get this statement about needing to be born from above and takes it very literally. It's one of many occasions in John's Gospel where characters do that. So we see it in chapter 4, for example, with the woman at the well, taking what Jesus says about living water too literally initially. Though she gets rather further on with her journey than Nicodemus does here. Jesus tries to teach Nicodemus in verses 5 to 8 and outline what he means. And the essence of it is it's not enough to be born into the family of Abraham. You have to be um, someone willing to have a spiritual rebirth in order to be able to belong to the kingdom of God. Now, this business of being born of water and the spirit reminds us of Jesus's baptism, in which in chapter one, verses 29 to 33, we're told that after Jesus got out of the water, the spirit descended upon him like a dove. And we have both the imagery of physical birth in the waters and the waters of baptism. And we have the spiritual rebirth the Holy Spirit brings. And these things are held together very much in this verse. And that resonates with the early church's understanding of what baptism is about. Indeed, it's key to our baptismal liturgies today. Jesus notably doesn't set flesh and spirit against one another here. Um, it's true that in John's Gospel, when it talks about the spirit and the flesh, it is sometimes setting up a, a contrast between that which is of God and what isn't. But here it's saying that the physical and the spiritual belong together. And that's really important because the kind of platonic dualism that would split them apart and create a hierarchy where spiritual is top of the tree and physical is discardable and corrupt and maybe kind of dirty, dodgy. That's not what's going on here, and it's not what John's Gospel is about. When it talks in verse 8 in particular about the spirit and the language of wind and blowing where it will, it plays on the fact that the Greek word pneuma can be translated as wind or breath or spirit, has all three meanings. So like the breath of God in Genesis 2, the spirit gives life. And like the wind, the spirit blows where it will. It can't be contained or controlled. Now, all of this seems to be a bit much for Nicodemus. Remember, the Christian ideas about the Holy Spirit do go further than what we find when it talks about the spirit in the Hebrew scriptures. And Nicodemus, bless him, just doesn't get it. 
Jesus, in turn, we find out in verse 10, doesn't understand how Nicodemus doesn't understand if he is indeed a true teacher of Israel. Now, he acknowledges Nicodemus' status thus as a teacher of Israel, and also that Nicodemus appears to be exercising a representative role. I believe it's quite possible he'd come on behalf of all of the religious authorities. Perhaps he'd been sent on a kind of secret fact-finding mission. You see that in verses 11 and 12, where the you that's used is plural in the Greek. And you also see it back in verse 2, where Nicodemus talks about, we know you're this, we know you're that. And he, as I say, he may well have been speaking on behalf of the Jerusalem religious authorities, perhaps those who went out into the wilderness to question John the Baptist, as we learn in chapter 1, verse 24. Verses 14 to 15 continue this speech to Nicodemus and give us the only place in the whole of the New Testament where that story I mentioned from Numbers about Moses lifting up that bronze serpent is mentioned. And it recalls the prologue to John's Gospel and hence looks to the cross as revealing the fullness of God's love for human beings and indeed all that God has made. See, just as that serpent was lifted up to cure the people of Israel of the poison that had infected them, so the Son of Man would be lifted up on the cross to free God's creation from the poisons of sin and evil, and thus open the door to eternal life. Now note that John uses the terminology Son of Man in a different way to that which we find in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. He uses it as being about someone who has come from God and will return to God. Whereas in the Synoptic Gospels, it's more about a divine figure, a messianic, messianic figure, um, who would be rejected on earth, but later vindicated by God. So it's a different use of the same language. And in verses 15 and 16, we see some distinctive Johannine language that of eternal life. John very much understands eternal life as something that begins in the here and now and crosses the threshold of death. So it's not about escapism from this world. It's about entry into the kingdom of God. To embrace eternal life is to immerse oneself in the love of God and thus also to live under the reign of God in the here and now, becoming a citizen of the kingdom of God, in other words, as well as part of the family of God through the Holy Spirit. The crucifixion that enables this to happen is understood as the glorification of Jesus because it's in that lifting up that the full force of evil falls on him. And so we've got one of those double meanings again here of crucifixion and glorification going on. Now, some commentators see verses 16 to 21 as still being the words of Jesus, whereas others believe that this is where the gospel writer is speaking and offering his own understanding of who Jesus is, and perhaps bringing particular sayings that were used about Jesus by the Johannine community at this time. Either way, we know that verse 16 runs parallel to verses 14 and 15, in that the same light that sets creation free will enable it to have abundant life. And in verse 17, most famously, we learn that God's motivation in sending Jesus wasn't to condemn the world, wasn't to condemn that which God had made, but the motive was love and a desire for reconciliation. And you can see that fleshed out into the, in the letter to the Colossians in chapter 1, 15 to 20 kind of picks up on very similar themes and language to what we find in John's Gospel. Now it's worth noting that in verse 13, stepping back slightly therefore, Nicodemus had left the narrative, but he will appear again in John's Gospel. In chapter 7 verses 45 to 52, he gets a hard time from his fellow Pharisees for daring to suggest that Jesus shouldn't be condemned without a fair hearing. And in a detail that we find only in John's Gospel, he helps Joseph of Arimathea anoint Jesus' crucified body and lay it to rest in the tomb 
That's chapter 19, verses 38 to 42. And so it seems that Nicodemus had gone on a journey of, from a, an intellectualised faith, is the impression he kind of gives, through to a faith that's of the heart, that gets beyond theory and moves to practice. This is a reading that's been set for Trinity Sunday, and so it's useful to briefly note that all three members of the Trinity are referenced here. God, God the Father, is the one who loves the world enough to send the Son to rescue it. And the Greek that's used here, which I think is pronounced sozo, is translated um, as rescue or set free or make whole, quite legitimately, in verse 17. So God the Father has sent the Son for a kind of rescue mission, if you will. Jesus is the divine Son, but he's also fully human. And we see both of those things coming through in John's Gospel. He's the one who has descended from and will ascend back to heaven and always looks to the Father to know what he's about. So we've got the Father and the Son. And in this section, we've heard a lot already about the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit will later on, in verse 16 of chapter 14, be described as the advocate or comforter who will come after Jesus who appears in the resurrection appearance in John chapter 20, specifically verse 22. So it gives us a different take to that of Pentecost. But we definitely have Father, Son and Spirit. Now it's important that we keep in mind that this isn't a fully fleshed exploration of the doctrine of the Trinity. It would take hundreds of years for the church to formulate that. And even then, we can't capture the Trinity fully in any of our words or ideas or concepts. What John is doing here, I think, is showing us a passage in which Nicodemus is called to move beyond theorising an argument and into embracing spiritual rebirth, embracing eternal life, living in the reign of God, becoming a citizen of the kingdom. And that's perhaps the challenge it lays down for us. Are we willing to take the risk of embracing eternal life and becoming a citizen of the triune God's kingdom.